It's not only the Chinese people who have experienced the Communist Party's long march and Mao's cultural revolution. It's happening right here in America. Our next guest believes another long march and cultural revolution is underway in the United States. It's slowly crept into our culture and institutions. Christopher Rufo believes it's all part of a methodical plan to radically transform the USA. He is a writer, filmmaker, and senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. And his book, just released this week, is America's Cultural Revolution, How the Radical Left Conquered Everything. Chris, it's good to have you with us. It's not only Bud Light and Target pushing a leftist agenda on the culture, but many major corporations are now jumping into the culture war, embracing and pushing a leftist agenda. Why? Well, it's part of a multi-decade strategy and plan that was first devised by new left radicals and intellectuals in the late 1960s and early 1970s, who devised a plan that they called the long march through the existing institutions, meaning that they would enter into uh, businesses, academia, K-12 schools, government agencies, and bring their ideology with them to try to transform the culture of those institutions from within. They had first succeeded in academia, then in schools, now in HR offices, and of course, as we saw in the summer of 2020, all of the so-called DEI departments and institutions around the country. Um, this was not happening by accident, and so when people looked around them in the summer of 2020 and said, wait a minute, all of our institutions are subtly in lockstep behind critical race theory and other ideologies. Um, it's important to know that it didn't happen by accident, but was part of this decades long process. And Chris, instead of constitutional justice, people often experience leftist mob justice. Equity is emphasized over equality. And some people on the political right contend even the Pentagon is spending more time defending the rights of transsexuals in the military than defending the country. So how did this diversity, equity, and inclusion offices, how did they become institutionalized in government and business? Through a couple different avenues. First, the activists from the outside used uh, civil rights law and actually hijacked civil rights law in order to force these kind of training programs into all of the institutions under the argument that these institutions were racist because they had disparate outcomes based on racial groups. Um, and then once they became entrenched, they found problem after problem after problem, or rather more accurately, uh, they, they invented problem after problem after problem to the point where now in many government agencies, uh, they're teaching a style of critical race theory that examines everything under the lens of race and finds that everyone, surprise, surprise, suffers from unconscious bias, white privilege, white fragility, internalized whiteness, and they hold the keys to solving these problems. And it first started in some of the softer institutions, the Department of Education and other more typically left-leaning, but now has really taken over the highest reaches of the military. In 2020, we of course saw George Floyd protests and defund the police efforts pushed by Black Lives Matter. And the former leaders, the organizers of BLM, admitted they were trained Marxists. So how and why did Minneapolis, Minnesota, become the epicenter of the BLM movement when it's not a Marxist city? Less than 20% of the population is black. How did that happen? Well, I think there are many uh, majority white cities in the United States that are very left-leaning. Certainly Minneapolis counts for that. And then where I am in the Pacific Northwest, cities like Seattle and Portland also saw the most extreme rioting and violence uh, during the protests in the summer of 2020. And these are cities where the ideology has taken hold. And the ideology knows, and the activists and BLM, uh, and, and activists really dating back to the Black Panther Party in the 1960s, they know that these images of uh, police violence and brutality are the most uh, uh, effective spark uh, for starting large-scale social rioting and protests. And so they take these images that are now supercharged through social media. Um, it started in Minneapolis, but then, of course, it spread uh, to more than 140 cities around the country. And I'm old enough to remember Angela Davis, who was a communist and member of the Black Panther Party in the late 1960s. So you referred to the Black Panther Party. How have Davis and the Black Panthers influenced public education in this country 55 years later? Uh, tremendously. In the research for the book, I discovered some uh, really disturbing patterns. And one of these was that I read through all of the old Black Panther Party, Marxist-Leninist, radical literature from the late 1960s. And then I compared it with documents from many school districts around the country that I've been reporting on 
from 2020, 2021, 2022. And I found that the basic set of ideas from Black Panther ideology had migrated all the way into the kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade curriculum, covered sometimes in some euphemism, but the basic ideology is there almost completely intact. Um, it really shows the strategy of marching through the institutions, bringing the ideology, and then forcing it onto other people's kids in the classrooms. It should give all Americans pause. How did this happen? How did these ideas go from the radical violent fringes into your child's kindergarten classroom? So why this focus on race? Why now? Yeah, it's quite an interesting inversion where um, of the instances of, of explicit racial segregation in public institutions that I document in the book, they're all promoted by very far left-wing racialists who believe, in a sense, a new kind of race essentialism. They believe that people are determined by their racial ancestry and categorization, and that it is better for uh, uh, whites to have separate facilities and DEI training programs than, uh, than African Americans and other minority groups, so that whites can deconstruct their privilege and that minority groups uh, can, can, can grapple with their oppression. Um, it's totally counterproductive. It's totally antithetical to what we should be doing. Um, and, and I find it just the, the deepest and kind of most sickening irony um, that we cannot uh, uh, get to a colorblind society, an equal society, a society of individual rights, um, because these people de are determined to drag us um, into this, this really dead-end direction. Okay. One race, the human race. Let's talk again sometime in the days ahead, Chris. There's much more in your book, America's Cultural Revolution, How the Radical Left Conquered Everything. Christopher Rufo, thank you for sharing your insights. We appreciate it. Thank you.